Okay, video number one out of our Schneider TM3 expansion modules video set. And the TM3s are going to be expansion modules that work with a whole pile of classes of Schneiders. What we're going to start with though is the very first one here, syncing digital inputs that are going to be used inside of there. So this video is specifically based uh, around the TM3 DIA, and that's the one we're going to see illustrated and that we're going to draw our connections onto. However, it does also apply to these ones over here, the TM3 DI, standing for digital or discrete input, and then 16 or 32 referring to the number of IO points it has. So if you can understand what we do with this DI8, you'll just be able to scale that up to take a look at the 16 or 32. First thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the manufacturer's product data sheet. Uh, this tells us a couple of important things. First of all, it tells us which families we are going to use this with. The 221, the 241, the 251, and the 262 are all compatible with these. It tells us that it's an 8 input and that it is standardized to the IEC 61131. That's our main PLC standards that we are going to go and have. It tells us that we can go and use this thing for syncing or sourcing and that it has got 24 volts nominal and 7 milliamps per input. In other words, it's not going to create a massive draw on our power supply if we are sending signals into this card itself. A couple other things that we can take a look at in what they refer to as the complementary part of the data sheet. It's going to be additional information. Uh, they give us a little bit of information on the current consumption that we are going to go and have based on whether it is at a state on or whether it's going to go and be at a state off. And that's from the bus connector and then the 24 volts as well. We're not going to look into that because we're not so much looking at the power budget for this one. What we do want to take a look at is these ones over here. The voltage state one guaranteed and current state one and the voltage state zero or the current state zero guarantee that we are going to have. And what this tells us is it tells us acceptable limits for use. If we take a look, we have got 24 volts. That's our nominal input that we are going to go and have. In reality, this thing is going to go and take anything that is from 15 to 28.8. So anywhere in this range to this range over here, we'll just make that a dotted line, is considered to be a good high input or what we would refer to as a one on there. Same with our voltage state zero that we are going to have. It's going to go and have its own range down at the bottom and it takes anywhere between zero to five volts that it is going to go and take as being a zero that we are going to go and have. So guaranteed off, guaranteed on up top there. It does leave us with this middle section over here. This middle section would be what we refer to as the undefined range. Undefined does not mean it does nothing. It just means that there is no guarantee that any voltage signal that you take in at these levels, let's say it was 24 volts for this thing and that we're bringing in 12 volts. They'd say that at 12 volt, they can't guarantee whether that 12 volt is going to trigger high or whether that 12 volt would go and trigger low. So we just keep all of our signals high enough or low enough so that they're going to be inside of one of these two ranges. Be very careful. Obviously, this thing has been rated for 24 volts, so use proper 24 volts. If you have a bit of volts drop on it, it's not going to be the end of the world. But if you've got too much volts drop, you sag down into this undefined range and you can no longer trigger inputs reliably. Input impedance is going to be 3.4 kilo ohms. This is just going to go and, you know, limit the amount of current we have coming in there. And then response time is going to be in the milliseconds for turn on and turn off. We're going to be using a syncing input connection. Syncing always refers to a direct connection of the negative to the reference or to the common terminal. And the way that we're using this as syncing on input would be an application of IEC positive logic. There is a complete other video out of the 221 video set that deals with syncing and sourcing. It's about 20 minutes long. So if you don't understand them, watch through the whole thing. We go through syncing, sourcing, and then we also go through IEC positive logic and negative logic. Hopefully should be enough that you can, you know, get an understanding of that topic because it's critical. There is some danger using the IEC negative logic, not with the positive logic, though. All right, last sheet that we're going to look at before we get into the wiring here is going to be the installation sheet. This is what comes folded in the box with each one of these. This over here on that installation sheet. And they give us a generalized installation sheet that has got many, many, many uh, different input uh, modules on it. Look for the one that's going to be labeled with what we're looking for, specifically the TM3 DI8. And if I take a look at that, it shows me that I can go and do one of two things. I can either attach a negative that they have over here to my commons like this over here, and then take a positive stinger out to my field devices to go and switch in, 
or it could do the alternate, the B method over here. What you're not supposed to do is A and B at the same time. B is going to be a sourcing input. We're going to scratch that out because that's not what we're looking at. This is what we're going to go and replicate. Taking a negative 24 volts DC because that's what's rated for, attaching the negative to the common because that is going to go and be syncing direct connection of the negative to the reference or to the common that we will have, and then taking our positive out to the field devices. One thing that is missing on here that uh, actually surprised me because Schneider has been very, very good about putting these onto pretty much every other data sheet they have, but for some reason, this family, they forgot to add in the fusing that you are going to go and have over here on your 24 volt power supply. So we'll add that in ourselves. Um, manufacturers are no different than you or I. They make mistakes as well and stuff sometimes doesn't always get caught. So we'll add that fusing in ourselves. The way we add fusing is we're going to just mount a DIN rail fuse holder, two main types that you can go and use. There's these really, really skinny type that are going to take those small glass or ceramic fuses. Uh, I do prefer the kind that have got this. That's going to be an indicator that tells you when you get a blown fuse. Or you can use the larger ones here, the class CC fuses, the 10 by 38 fuses that they have. Uh, if you do use that, use HCLR types because usually in PLC work, you're recommended to be using a type T fuse, which is extremely fast acting. However, uh, um, those can be hard to get fuse holders for and hard to go and find fuses for. These CCs, they're very common. Same with these little ceramics are also going to be quite common. Okay, so now we've got a PLC set up. Let's just go over some components on it real quick and then we'll start the actual connections. First thing that we see is that we have got AC being brought in onto my uh, distribution blocks here on the DIN rail. I've got my neutral, I have got my bond, I have got a small DIN rail circuit breaker. I'm taking that AC in, I'm feeding that into a DC power supply and I'm converting that into 24 volts DC over here. That 24 volts DC, I am then feeding the positive out into a set of breakers. That's the, or sorry, breakers, DIN rail fuses. That's these two over here. One of these sets of DIN rail fuses provides power all the way into my main PLC body. This is my PLC brain. It's an M251 that we are going to have over here uh, with some serial ethernet uh, communications and stuff on board. And the M251 class does not have onboard inputs and outputs. It's simply a brain and we always have to go and attach these expansion modules to it. This is the expansion module we are going to be wiring to it. Uh, first one that we have, which is going to be my inputs and any additional ones would just get added onto the side right next to that so we're only putting one on here for this one okay we said that we are going to work with a syncing style of input so a syncing style of input means that we are going to have to go and attach our negative to the common so the first thing that we are going to do is we are going to take a negative line out and we're going to run that down and take that all the way out over here and then we're going to go and pick up all of my common points over here. In and out, no more than two wires per terminal. It's best to go and use little ferrule crimps on each of these to go and confine your strands because you will be working with stranded wire. Uh, in most cases, I've seen people do it solid as well, but stranded is always recommended. So we've got our negative carried in. The next thing we would do is we would go and take our positive around. So you don't want to take it directly from the power supply. You do want to take it out of a fuse holder itself to go and protect that circuit because you're running out to field devices. So you could go and drop in onto each of your individual field devices. We're just running a hot stinger all the way around. At this point, we have got our field devices powered up. Last thing that we would do is then we would just go and take an input from each of these. We've got a normally closed stop, normally open start. We've got a selector switches over here. You would just run inputs from these down to your PLC, terminating them inside of each of these individual sections. So we'll run these out, we'll run these out, we'll run these out. So at this point, we've got a bunch of discrete inputs. They're going to be on or off tile of inputs that we would have using these ones over here. We see that we've got our negative carried all the way through. And if we follow through our path for power, you always need to be able to form a complete path for power, positive, going through, pick a field device to go through. We'll go through this normally closed, hitting the input card, going through the card and coming back on the negative to your power supply over here, that reference that we have. It's important that you have that complete path all the way through. Our last component that we have over here on this side 
is going to be a sensor that we are going to have. We've got the European standard wiring for this one. North American standard is red and black for positive and negative. In Europe, they do use this, the brown for positive, the blue for negative, and then the black is going to be the signal. We want to connect this thing onto ours. So what we will do is we will go and run out from our power supply over here another negative. We'll just take that one all the way across the top over here. And this thing needs to go to my negative line. Lots of mistakes get made in North America where the people try to use the black as the negative. We're also going to go and run a positive from my closest positive. Once again, running through the fuse holder. So I'll just take it off of this one over here down to my positive lead. And then the last thing that you would need to do is you would need to go and run from there with your signal back in there. Because we are dealing with a sinking style over here, that means we're taking a positive in. If I go back just two slides like this, we see that we are always taking a positive in. So the type of sensor that we must be using will be what is referred to as a PN style of three wire transistor sensor over here very first letter inside of each of these always tells you what it outputs this pnp outputs a positive to my load okay that is all that we need to go and cover on using a tm3 di8 this card specifically for digital inputs